Living creatures observed from an outward point of view, William James says, seem to be bundles of habits. In wild animals, their usual round of daily behavior seems a necessity implanted at birth. In animals domesticated, and especially in man, it seems to be the result of education to a great extent. Instincts are the habits to which there is an innate tendency, and some of those due to education would by most persons be called acts of reason. The laws of nature are nothing but the immutable habits which the different elementary sorts of matter follow in their actions and reactions to each other. However, in the organic world, the habits are more variable than this. The habits of an elementary particle of matter cannot change on the principles of the atomic philosophy, because the particle is itself an unchangeable thing. But those of a compound mass of matter can change, because they are in the last instance due to the structure of the compound, and either outward forces or inward tensions can, from one hour to another, turn that structure into something different from what it originally was. That is, they can do so if the body is plastic enough to maintain its integrity and be not disrupted when its structure yields. So, he puts that plasticity, in the wide sense of the word, is the possession of a structure weak enough to yield to an influence, but strong not to yield all at once. And in this sense, such a structure, each relatively stable phase of equilibrium is marked by a new set of habits. And organic matter, especially nervous tissue, is endowed with a very extraordinary degree of plasticity of this sort. So he lays down his first proposition that the phenomena of habit in living beings are due to the plasticity of the organic materials of which their bodies are composed. Further, he quotes Léon Dumont's essay which writes, Everyone knows how a garment, after having been worn a certain time, clings to the shape of the body better than when it was new. And a lock works better after being used some time. At the outset more force was required to overcome certain roughness in the mechanism. The overcoming of the resistance is a phenomenon of habituation. It costs less trouble to fold a paper when it has been folded already. This saving of trouble is due to the essential nature of habit, which brings it about that, to reproduce the effect, a less amount of the outward cause is required. Water, in flowing, hollows out for itself a channel, which grows broader and deeper, and, after having ceased to flow, it resumes when it flows again. The path traced by itself before. Just so, the impressions of outer objects fashion for themselves in the nervous system more and more appropriate paths, and these vital phenomena recur under similar excitements from without, when they have been interrupted a certain time. William James continues that this is not only the case of the nervous system alone. For a scar anywhere a locus minoris resistentiae is more liable to be abraded inflamed to suffer pain and cold than are the neighboring parts. And he says if we ascend to the nervous system, we find how many so-called functional diseases seem to keep themselves going simply because they happen to have once begun, and how often sufficient to enable the physiological forces to get possession of the field again, and bring the organs back to functions of health. Epilepsies, neuralgias, convulsive affections of various sorts, and insomnia are so many cases in point. As for the currents, if they are once in, they must find a way out. In getting out, they leave their traces in the paths which they take. The only thing they can do, in short, is to deepen old paths or to make new ones. And the whole plasticity of the brain sums itself up in two words when we call it an organ, in which currents pouring in from the sense, organs make with extreme facility paths which do not easily disappear. Of course, simple habits like snuffling or biting one's nails are mechanically nothing but a reflex discharge, and its anatomical substratum must be a path in the system. The most complex habits are, from the same point of view, nothing but concatenated discharge in the nerve centers, due to the presence of the systems of reflex paths. 
the impression produced by one muscular contraction serving as a stimulus to provoke the next, until a final impression inhibits the process and closes the chain. The entire nervous system is nothing but a system of paths between a sensory terminus, a quo, and a muscular, glandular, or other terminus ad quem. And he points out that the growth of structural modification in living matter is more rapid than in any lifeless mass because the incessant nutritive renovation tends often to corroborate and fix the impressed modification, rather than to counteract it by renewing the original constitution. Also, the nervous substance is especially distinguished by its reparative power. For while injuries of other tissues, such as the muscular, are repaired by the substance of a lower or less specialized type, those of nerve substance are repaired by a complete reproduction of the normal tissue. This is afforded by the results of brown cigars experiments upon the gradual restoration of the functional activity of the spinal cord after its complete division which takes place in a way that indicates rather a reproduction of the whole than a mere reunion of the divided surface. And our nervous system grows to the modes in which it has been exercised, and it may endure to the end of life, like the scar of a wound. So, finally, he quotes a saying of one German author, We learn to swim during the winter and skate during the summer.